Good evening, everyone. We're so glad to be here with you tonight. Um, we are very fortunate. Um, my name is Sue Tron, and I'm here on behalf of the Utah Film Center as just a volunteer. Um, as you may know, I'm a third district court judge and uh, also a lawyer. So I've been in the legal profession since 1994 here in Utah. And I was asked and this is such a privilege to interview and have a discussion with Frida Lee Mock, who is the director of, of tonight's film, Ruth, in her own words. So um, I hope that you uh, will send some uh, questions in chat to us, and then we will certainly um, ask uh, Frida about them. So Frida is an Academy Award winning filmmaker, a director, producer, and writer. And she has so many award-winning films. Um, one of the ones that I found really interesting was called Sing. And it's about a Los Angeles community-based children's chor chorus that struggles against cutbacks. She's also um, directed this film about Maya Lin, A Strong, Clear Vision. She's uh, directed this uh, film about Anita Hill and her story, which is very interesting for those of you that are familiar with that story. But um, there were so many things and I also noticed that she is she also went to UC Berkeley so I have to shout this out for Max Chang go Bears <laughs> and uh, she has studied law and history and is a um, has uh, been making these films she's also been associated with Gerilyn Dreyfus who is one of the co-founders of the Utah Film Center and so uh, we'd like to welcome Frida here today so thank you for being here um, the first question I had for you is what inspired you to uh, make this story of Justice Ginsburg? Well, thank you for having me uh, this evening after the, your, uh, the audience, uh, uh, Ruth. And I'm here mainly because of uh, Geraldine Dreyfus. I think uh, all of you sitting here uh, with the center uh, are beneficiaries of her wonderful visioning vision. She was a co-founder of not only the Utah Film Center, but she is the co is the executive producer of of Ruth. And she and her dear colleague um, Regina Scully came to me and uh, and asked me if I would like to do a film on Justice Ginsburg. And of course, I, I leaped at the chance. I, I hadn't studied her and I hadn't read any, any biographies. I actually had read a biography, an autobiography of Sonia Sotomayor. So if I were to do a film on a justice, that's the one I knew the best because of, the, of her book. Um, and, but, so that's, that inspired me was the, was the, um, the ask by um, Gerilyn Dreyfus and Regina Scully. Um, and so uh, I was thrilled with the chance to really, what I call it, to take a deep dive, do, you know, breadth, do a great deal of research and breadth and depth to see what this story might develop into a one and a half hour to two hour film. Um, so actually, um, I had a, a, a correspondence with uh, Justice Ginsburg because of the Anita Hill film. Uh, she had heard I had done this film and uh, through a mutual uh, a, a friend asked if I uh, would uh, send her whether she could see the film. So I sent her a DVD of, of Anita and actually the Maya Lin film and um, she wrote me back, which surprised me because I figured she was very busy and to take time to write a really uh, nice heartfelt note was wonderful for me. But that, that was the sort of the beginning of our, our kind of email of course no actually correspondence and then when Gerilyn came to me with this project I wrote her again and said asked if it were possible to um, seek a cooperation doing this film and she responded saying let's wait until 216 when the fiction movie on the base of a set of sex was to be finished and so and then we would speak about this this documentary well, 216 rolled around, the fiction movie didn't come out, the, the election happened the way it did. And so in 217, our team, Gerilyn, Regina and I, and uh, it's time to do this story and to, to have this, the, 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 the ideas and, and the, the, the entire body of work uh, in the law and gender and the, uh, uh, women in the law that uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, really defined um, the new law in terms of, of uh, women's rights. So we started in 217 and um, that, that was the, 
um, the genesis of this project. And I'm delighted to be here tonight to answer any questions. Great, and we're so glad to have you here. Um, and I hope that people do send us chats to let us know what questions they'd like to hear from you. But one thing I'd like to know is, uh, well, there's two, uh, two things. This is a two part question. So the first one is how many hours of footage did you uh, review before preparing this movie? It's a great question because as you can see, there's a um, wonderful footage of, a, of Justice Ginsburg before she was a justice. You see her as a professor when she's in her 40s. You see her um, when she's a, uh, a judge on the appellate court. And, and basically, uh, in starting this film, I, 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 I try to first understand what the story is. And so I, I do a lot of you know, um, primary research and secondary research in terms of, of, of text. So um, I, I try to understand the big picture and the story and the themes before I put, uh, you might say, um, to start the filming. And because she's lived this extraordinary long life, I we all figured that there's a great deal of footage on her. So we started uh, develop, uh, doing research that is with our team of, of stock footage researchers started looking, up, looking through the potential of all the archives. So we ended up probably seeing 500, 600 hours of more, on more of uh, footage of, of, doc, of uh, Ruth Ginsburg in, before she became a justice. And so that shaped what, pretty, what the visual material, the visual story of uh, Judge, Justice Ginsburg would be. And uh, I particularly love the early footage because you see her, uh, and in one sense, a little less, uh, less uh, uh, cautious, you might say. I think when you're such a, a dominant public figure as a justice, you people look look and, and listen to every word. And as you know, in the, in the 216 presidential campaign, she got into a little trouble because she spontaneously in a, in a, a, a public gathering called um, uh, the candidate Trump a faker. So uh, you, you're very aware of that, that she has to be careful what she says. And so in the earlier footage, you see she's quite spontaneous and, uh, um, and unfiltered, you might say. So um, it was wonderful to see her in these different phases of her, of her life. And uh, so there were, there were hours. Okay. Uh, yeah, months and months of research, basically. And that's how I found uh, Justice uh, Goodwin. You know, I, I felt we needed to tell the story of the clerk, of a law clerk's relationship to uh, Justice Ginsburg and, and what, what impact she has, has had on her many, many clerks. And I found, I found that clerk in, in a, a footage. I, I saw that footage of the, which is in the film, as you see. There was a, right. I just felt that that you know, I could have asked people for recommendations, and but footage really tells you, uh, I think, the dynamic truth. I felt there was a really great di uh, relationship. There, there was a clear, it's clear to me that they liked being with each other, and there was a, a real a nice interchange between them. So that's how I I found uh, uh, Justice Liu. Well, I was going to ask you that as a different question as to how you chose some of these interviewees because. Uh, in the legal community, there's a lot of people who have a lot of respect for uh, Dean Chemerinsky, for example, and he's a well noted uh, uh, Supreme Court scholar. Um, I have a friend in the legal community who says that she has a crush on him. <laughs> and so, so, but I mean, you pick such interesting people and I, why did you decide to pick some of them? Yeah, well, in the case of, it, well, exactly that I said, he, you know, I was aware of exactly what you said about him, his distinguished record as a constitutional scholar and particularly as a, a professor teaching, um, you know, hundreds of, of uh, law students, both at Irvine and, and starting more recently at Berkeley and, and earlier. Um, so I was looking for a constitutional scholar and he just was prominent. So it was a Kind of an easy choice, so to speak. He's popular as well, well known because he does op-ed pieces in you know the newspapers and, and in books. 
So I particularly was interested in talking to him, and I was surprised by his response, that as a constitutional scholar, with having taught, you know, decades of students, uh, law students, you know, I asked him the question, basic question, well, what what do the law students ask you about the Supreme Court? What, what, what really engages them? And he shocked me by saying, they don't, they don't know anything about the Supreme Court. He was saying, and that's why, you know, seven dwarves enter into the film, right? He, he said exactly that. He said, the, the students know, know the names, of the seven dwarves probably more than they know the names of the Supreme Court justices. I don't think it's so true now, I think, because of the, you know, intense, um, <laughs> you know, polarization and, and, and news with the Kavanaugh hearings and, you know, with the 20 something years ago with the Clarence Thomas hearings that, that people are, are very aware, I think, of the Supreme Court, at least maybe after law school they are. I, I know, but anyway, that, that surprised me, but I particularly liked his presence in the film for, uh, in giving us that sense of the broad comments about constitutional ideas. And also because he had, uh, argued five cases before the uh, uh, the Supreme Court with Justice Ginsburg. I felt there was a really strong resonance to have him be a part of this film. And in fact, all the other interviewees um, were selected because of their really uh, sort of professional relationship with them. That everyone has had some, they're not just necessarily experts about her, wonderful biographers. Instead, they um, have had such as, they've, they've, they've worked with her either as a volunteer law student, such as M.E. Freeman, you know, that I thought was remarkable, as she said, that as a Columbia law student, uh, she, uh, that uh, advocate, uh, Ruth Ginsburg, asked her to accompany her to Washington and to sit at the council table in the Supreme Court. So she was witness to the interchange of, of uh, advocate or litigator uh, Ginsburg with those nine male justices. And she brought, I felt, a really an insider view and interpretation, only she having seen her in action in the Supreme Court said some things. I love her comment about, how she she was the top of her game the way Tiger Woods uh, has been at the top of his game. So I, I love that kind of the the comparison of the golfer and lit and the litigator. Yeah. So all yeah. those like li like uh, li uh, Lily Ledbetter was profoundly impacted um, by Justice Ginsburg's um, dissent. Uh, and so, if, uh, and Kathleen Paratus is an attorney who she um, met at ACLU uh, in the 70s. So each, everyone, including uh, the biographers um, of the notorious uh, RBG book, um, one of course was a law student, you know, who was so impressed by and aghast really at the rulings. Uh, in the Heller case, the, yeah, the, the voting rights case that um, she started the notorious RBG blog, uh, the Tumblr that went you know, viral in 213. And then Justice Ginsburg became this amazing icon. Yeah. And of course, uh, with Irin uh, Carmone, who is the co-author co of that book, uh, not only she is the biographer, but actually she married her uh, if you saw a picture in the, the end, um, she officiated at, their, at, at her wedding. So there's a, there's a really kind of a real personal professional connection, I think, with all the interviewees. Yeah, yeah and I like the story about um, Jennifer Carol Foy, you know, and how it really changed her life. And that was amazing that the impact that Justice Ginsburg did have on a lot of people. Yes. Uh, Madison wants to know, uh, how has this intimate exposure to Justice Ginsburg's life and the curation of this beautiful film changed your perspective and your personal and professional path? Um, it, my personal path is to work harder. <laughs> I mean, I am, I mean, you know, I, I felt with her passing particularly because 
I'd only felt that she's with us and you know we're, we're going forward in certain ways that that uh, the word profound came I, I, I've said uh, when I found out that she had passed and uh, I, I find that her work ethic her the impact she had in terms of uh, women and the law uh, the the um, enormous output not only in terms of you know the 400 plus opinions both consenting and dissenting opinions she's written um, um, books she's written um, that I, I just find that she's such an inspirational person who who for me uh, suggests that I and others could do more <laughs> yeah um, I find specifically her writing is so exceptional and so clear and powerful. It sort of reminded me that perhaps I can too communicate a little more impactfully by uh, taking the time and thinking quickly the impact of what uh, I might write or say. So um, I, I feel that um, She's an, an, an amazing gift to all of us. Well, if you had to pick one word to describe Justice Ginsburg, do you know what one word would just come quickly to your mind? Integrity. Okay. That's it. <laughs> I think she's all of those. The word that comes to my mind is equality because I think that the fact that she fought for men too, it wasn't just about women was trying to make it fair for everyone. Absolutely. And that's what was interesting about your film as well. Um, what did you, out of all the clips that you viewed, what is some things that you learned about Justice Ginsburg that um, didn't get put in the film? Um, I didn't, uh, you know, she's a terrible cook, she'll admit. She does not cook, she just is not a, a person who thrives in the kitchen, her husband is infamous uh and um she's not very funny about that how she's you know her children said you know mom mom doesn't belong in the kitchen so to speak and uh, um and she's very funny about that so that that's just one idea but i think that's uh it, that's Anyway, people know about that, so I thought we could leave that out. But that uh, um, the one thing that um, she, I, I didn't see, find footage, and I know that when I asked to film with her, there wasn't time to possibly even do this idea, but she loves, she likes, she liked to take her uh, law clerks to the uh, local prison to, to, sh to sort of remind them that these are ordinary people. And to remind them that the, the law deals with just um, just people that what they're doing is not principle uh, it's principles but there are people involved and that that kind of meeting of of the community I think is very interesting and dramatic yeah but that didn't get into the film yeah. I had read something somewhere that you had said something about Sweden that she had gone to Sweden and that was yes. something that very few people knew about and i didn't know about that till i read this article about you yes so. well it turns out too that there was um uh, i i think that's really fascinating because it was the first time i think she'd left her family this was before she started teaching at rutgers in columbia in the uh, mid let's see 63 i think it's right after she had done her two years of uh, of um work with um the judge uh, judge palmieri um, she took a job with Columbia, a research uh, project, uh, which was to study civil procedure in Sweden and to write a book about that. And um, I think it's what's important about that experience is that she, um, it was profoundly impactful in terms of seeing uh, the gender equality in, in that um, country. Um, this is the early 60s. Um, she saw how women were more integrated into the community that at least 25% of, as an example, uh, law students were women. And she saw a woman judge who was eight months pregnant 
and she could she could see the possibilities of a of a, a gender of a society with greater equality. And I think it had a profound impact when she had the opportunity as a litigator to do work in that area in, in the 70s, basically. Um, that, that would have been uh, an interesting aside because you're right, because very few people know about that. And, and then she wrote uh, the definitive, uh, first of all, it's so amazing too, of course she's gonna learn Swedish, right? She learned the language in order for her to read and do the research. And then uh, she published uh, pretty much, they say the definitive book on, civil, uh, on uh, Swedish civil uh, procedure with um, a, a Swedish um, ju ju a judge, Bruce Elias, yeah. And she's the beloved in, in Sweden and she received an honorary doctorate actually um, in her, in 1969 for her work. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah. I don't know that I could learn Swedish. I know, I too, but, I, <laughs> I, but of course she can because she, she was, She's just an exceptional, she has an exceptional mind and uh, she could, I think she could do anything. <laughs> Great. Well, Tanner wants to know from a filmmaking perspective, how many hours of film did you review versus how much went into the documentary? Good question. Well, as I said, four to, I think, oh my, let's say, let's say hours, okay? Let's say that uh, probably four to 500 hours of footage, of stock footage I looked at. And then separate from that, the amount of footage that we filmed was probably another, maybe not actually that much, maybe 35, 40 hours. Yeah. And, and so we're talking about uh, weeks of sitting, <laughs> looking at footage. Okay. Um, so the film is an hour and a half, uh, just about an hour and a half, but it, it just, uh, you look for the gold in whatever you, what your uh, the visual and audio material. And the, and uh, as you know, too, we added, uh, uh, actually, I, I love particularly the illustrations, the animation in the film. Um, I think attorneys particularly like that, how we explain the cases by using, by using the animation. And that was the big challenge was how do you explain complex constitutional uh, issues? Right. That, is, that is clear, but not too simple. But so that was a solution, uh, marrying that with her actual words um, during the um, uh, arguments. Well, so, another person, uh, JD is asking, how did you choose the cases to highlight? You know, why did you choose the ones that you did? Well, we, we highlighted um, in terms of the, con the 70s cases, the, 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 of the six constitutional cases she argued, you know, she won five. And um, the ones that I, I felt we didn't have to, it's not a film that, that does every that, that goes through every case, and I, we didn't feel that was necessary. But we felt the one we wanted to use the ones that were, in one sense, um, dramatic and easy to express. In one sense, um, and um, I know that uh, TikTok picked up on the case of the beer case. You know, of the frat boys. You know, because that's a very important case in terms. It's a silly case in one sense. They, it's, it's, you know, but you can see that how unfair it was between boys drinking at 21 and girls, uh, women, the girls drinking at 18. Uh, but it made a very important constitutional uh, uh, point. You know? uh, but that, that was, um, was a fun case. It was, she spoke about it and the kids were, you know, the wonderful fifth graders in the classroom, uh, in her, uh, in her um, office area, were interested in all the cases, yeah. So we, I just, I think we are, we used, we, we certainly felt it was important to underscore the fact that she loved using male plaintiffs to make that point that the gender uh, discriminatory laws uh, impacted men as well as women. So those, those male plaintiffs were really persuasive with all, when you had all, all the justices um, being male. Right. Yeah. Um, another question that came through is what were some of your favorite things you had to leave out or couldn't find footage of? Well, pretty much what I stated, you know, it was the jail, visiting the jail, uh, uh, and, and certainly the going to Sweden, uh, that, that whole, uh, yeah. But, uh, I was particularly happy about a couple of things that I, I've, uh, heard, um, 
no other national leader, I feel, has spoken about two very important ideas, um, challenging ideas. And one is um, unconscious bias. When she was asked by uh, Justice Goodwin, you know, what remains? And she said, out of the 70s, we, you know, we pretty much dealt with all the hundreds of uh, discrimin the uh, laws that discriminated on the basis of sex. But the one remaining issue is unconscious bias as it pertains at that time related to uh, sexual issues. But, but actually, as we know, it applies to issues of race and um, uh, LGBTQ and ageism, all that. Uh, that, that issue is, uh, I think she was keen on, on how that is really a, a roadblock to full equality. And the other is that she's the only one I find a national leader who speaks about the violation of rights due uh, to the, the, uh, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and she, she spotlights that whenever she can. So, so that I'm happy to have in the film, how's that? <laughs> well, and I thought that was really moving to having, ha having known people like our local judge, retired judge Uno, who was sent to, um, oh, what is it called? Heart Mountain in Wyoming. And so he talks about his experience. And so it's very, very moving um, having Japanese American friends who live in Utah and have been through that. So yes. Yes. the last thing I wanna ask you before we wrap up, because you've been so kind with your time is one thing I found very interesting about your film and that you focused on was her friendship with Justice Scalia. And so many people seem to think, find that very difficult to believe, but I, I think it's very, uh, um, I just am thrilled that she does that because I do the same thing. I have friends on either side of the political spectrum because I think it's important to be friends with all people and see what they're thinking and saying because we can find common things. Did yeah. she say anything else about her friendship with Justice Scalia that you think is important to pass on? <sighs> I, I just feel that they really enjoyed each other's company and they respected each other so much. And um, I, think, I think it's, you can just see it. I guess if you watch them, you could say, why don't we enjoy each other as people, as the humanity, what, what, what binds us? What, what are the common denominators, common denominators that, that, that um, bring us together? And I, I think um, you, you can, uh, allow politics to, or other things, uh, to break out things. But maybe um, if we focus on that, which is, uh, that brings us together, that's, that's the, the best we can do with uh, each other and the larger community. Yeah. I think that's a, a great example. I mean, she believed in, in, in people certainly, and that applies to how she regarded uh, the three branches of government um that we all should work together and and she certainly proved that in the case of the lily ledbetter um uh, final law you know the court tried but then she figured it might be in as she said and now the issue of equal pay for women is in the hands uh, uh the ball is in the court of congress and finally president obama was able to take that and, and so um coming together is what she really like to, to was the was the goal and maybe we all can learn from that great well thank great. you so much for your time today frida we really really appreciate it here we've had i believe that there were, we've answered all the questions from the audience and um uh you also answered some of my questions after reviewing your movie so thank you so much for being here today so okay. everyone thank you for joining us in this conversation i hope you enjoyed the movie as much as i did and uh, please enjoy future films from Frida as well, as well as other filmmakers that come through the Utah Film Center. All right, thank you and good night. Thank you, Sue.